the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. We can't say that enough. It's been a wonderful week, a bright week. A lot of our homilies throughout the course of Lent, we talked about how it was a preparation period, a preparatory period for those who were going to be entering into the church. And how each one of the Sundays was introducing some aspect of church dogma, of church theology, of the things that we have seen, of the things that we have touched and handled. And it's there to present a catechism, an instruction for those who are coming into the church. And so for those who would have been uh, baptized during Holy Week, we had a family that we baptized on Holy Saturday. Welcome. (laughs) And we had others that we baptized uh, throughout that week and even before, what would have happened during this past week for those who would have been baptized and entered the church, particularly when you're talking about a period of time when the church is established, they're no longer uh, running and and hiding as much, those baptized persons would have stayed in the church, in and around the church, this entire week. They would have been there to have absorbed all the services, they would have heard the chanting of Christ is risen, over and over and over. If we think we've heard it a lot because we were here on Pascha and then Agape service and then now, imagine having been in the church every single day, all day long, for all those hours and services, hearing this over and over and over and over again. It's no wonder that the early saints were just fearless about death. Part of their instruction, which they were steeped in, was just this announcement of God having conquered death over and over again, and not some phantom conquering death. It's not like Marcion said, who's condemned for it, that somehow some spiritual thing rises from the dead, that somehow some disincarnate body of Christ rises from the dead. No, our conviction is that Jesus Christ gets up. In the words of Gregory the Great, the same body that was crucified and died gets up. And so... Those who would have been newly illuminated, newly baptized, would have spent the entire week in the church just being steeped in this, having absorbed this. On this day, they would have kind of had that part of the service where you say, you have been blessed, you have been baptized, and they're wiping them with the, the towel. That would have been on this day. They would have finally taken off their baptismal robes. So for those who may have been wearing their baptismal robes all week, you can take it off now. But that's what would have been going on. And so now we find ourselves on what we call Thomas Sunday. A lot of people from English-speaking parts of the world say this is Low Sunday. It's not a reference to the character of the people in the room. No, it's usually not even about the attendance on this day. The idea of Low Sunday, they think, may have been drawn from the idea of the lauds in Latin. That's what they may have taken it from. But also Thomas Sunday. And not doubting Thomas Sunday, but the blessed doubt of Thomas kind of Sunday. The anti-Pascha, this day. This day is kind of the bookend to the whole week of Bright Week, which is almost an unending day. If you look at the services, there's really kind of no formal beginning and end. You just kick it up with Christ is risen, and you finish it with Christ is risen. So now we bookend the week here with Thomas Sunday. And if anybody who was here last Sunday for the Agape Vespers That's for Bright Monday. We do it at noon here at this church on Sunday. You probably remember that the very last words that were said of that gospel reading, and not just in English, and not just in Greek, and not just in, let's see, Farsi and French and Spanish, German, uh, Hebrew, a whole host of languages, the last thing that the person heard walking out of the church on Sunday in all of those languages was, I will not believe. That's a curious ending. And every priest talks about this every year. And of course, that reading stops halfway through the reading of today. And so what happens today? Why is this considered the book end? Why are we celebrating Thomas on this day? What are we as Christians supposed to take away? Having heard the last thing last Sunday, I will not believe, which I believe is verse 25 if you're looking in your your, uh, bulletin. Today we have the story of uh, Thomas. And more fully, we know the story begins, it says that they're in the upper room. It's the evening of the first day. The Lord's tomb has been empty. 
And even while the myrrh bearers and Mary Magdalene have come to tell the disciples that the Lord has risen from the dead, they struggle and they grapple with the reality that could this really have happened? We'll talk about the myrrh bearing women next week, but they rationally say, who took, our, who took his body? Who took our Lord's body? Well, they come, they tell the disciples, they struggle with belief. We know the story that John and Peter run to the tomb to see what's going on. But at evening on that first day, <clears throat> it says the doors are shut for fear of the Jews. And all of a sudden, the God-man, the icon of love, the Son, walks, through the, walks in this room through closed doors. And not just a phantom, <clears throat> but he tells them to handle him. And it says the disciples do, they're overcome with joy, and they believe in him. We're going to come back at the very end of this homily to talk about what they are ordained to do and what that means for us, what we're ordained to do now as Christians. But we know, according to Gregory the Great, the blessing for us is that Thomas is not present to see this. And so now, eight days later, when they're in this room, the door's being shut, Christ appears again to them. Now, Chrysostom says eight days must have been required for Thomas to have gotten hungry enough to really want to see the Lord. Not just to say, I don't believe, but I really want to see Him. And we know the story. We know Jesus appears in the room, and He says to Thomas, put your hands in the imprint of the nails. Stretch out your hand and feel my side. The crucified, the King of glory, has flesh and bone and tells him to feel him. And, and also, it's not something that we can put away saying, well, that's maybe some precondition of how Christ will be glorified. No, that, that's a misunderstanding. As a matter of fact, you might remember when Mary Magdalene first sees the Lord, she goes to grab his feet. He says, don't touch me. I'm not ascended yet to the Father. And here we are, with the disciples, handle me, touch me. Which tells us this is him glorified. This is our king. This is an amazing story because certain church fathers say Thomas got to stick his fingers into the furnace of God. He touched God. That's incredible. Right? Have I been with you so long, Philip? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. This isn't some lesser appearance of God. This is God. And Thomas gets to touch him. As a matter of fact, of course, we know after this, Thomas believes, right? He says, my Lord and my God, or if anybody's a fan of Father Thomas Hopko, the Lord of me and the God of me. It's a very personal statement. But he believes. Now, John, it's a very Johannine thing. I'm sure Father's talked about it. A lot of things that John writes about, he writes in there, so that we may believe. We had a wedding yesterday. We talked about that first miracle the disciples believed. As a matter of fact, when John writes his epistles, what's the very first thing he says in them? We testify to the things that were there from the beginning and to that which we have seen, and then he doubles down, and looked upon with our eyes, and then he says that we've handled with our hands. That's a strong statement. He says, I testify to the things that we've seen and looked at and handled. And of course, we know Christ's response. Thomas, blessed are you because you believe. But of course, blessed more are those who believe and have not seen. And this is a great blessing for all of us here. Now, the story is incredible for a multitude of reasons. One, it shows the patience of God with Thomas. If you recall, Thomas was ready to go die with the Lord. Of course, he becomes afraid and he runs. But he knows that his Lord died. And God is patient with him to see that Thomas receives this good news of his resurrection. Our God is a patient God. It's also incredible to think about the fact that God in his relationship with us, this king, this God-man, condescends to tell his followers, I'm trying to find a king who maybe has done this before, handle me. If you have any doubts or any fears, feel me. The Lord shows up, not just in His compassion and His patience, but in His gentleness. He's trying to spur people on to belief. Well, Thomas believes. And we know, according to the tradition, Thomas goes as far as the Indus River Valley to preach this gospel of Jesus Christ. As John says, that which we have seen and which we have touched. 
Now, I don't know about you, but when I first heard that part and I was younger, that, well, blessed more are those who have not seen and yet believe, I thought, okay, there's a good mark for me that I might be able to have more faith than an apostle of the Lord. But then we as Orthodox Christians, one, we should rejoice in that. But that is how God sees things, that blessed more are those who having not seen and not touched, and here's the giveaway to the next line, and have not tasted him and yet believe in him. God bless those people. But what about us? That's a great blessing for us because we were not in that particular upper room. But as John Baer tells us, Christ is every bit present in this room as he was in that room. That's important. They had no benefit by being with him in the first century more than we have now by being here in this space with God. Jesus Christ is every bit as present in this room as he was in that room. And what do we get to do every week? It's, it's really beautiful. We come to this house, to this room, and at one point someone says, the doors, the doors, and then the liturgy of the faithful begins. The doors are shut in this upper room. And then Christ makes himself manifest in the wine and in the bread. And not just touching him, we come up and we consume him. The body and blood of Christ, of the glorified Christ, courses now through our veins. Yes, blessed are those who have seen, even though they've, they've blessed are those who having not seen, believed. But the great belief that we have every time we come here is our faith is strengthened. We get to touch God. We are invisibly enhanced and strengthened. The Lord is patient and compassionate. It's a reminder to us that as often as we can come, we should come. It bolsters our faith. Basil the Great, he says, when a Christian who consumes of God walks out the doors of his church, he is a fire-breathing lion. We're transformed. It's incredible. But there's something else that we're meant to do on this day, not just to rejoice in the fact, not just to rejoice in the fact that the resurrected God has condescended not just to be touched and handled, but that we could even consume of him, and that we have to even. That's how we have a part in him. But then he calls us to something. You might remember at the very beginning of the text, when Jesus says to the disciples, as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. He doesn't say, as the Father sent me, I sent you. He says, as the Father sent me, even so. The emphasis there. So I send you. It's what he says to each one of us. He breathes the Holy Spirit on them, on us, every one of us who has been baptized and chrismated. And then he charges them with something really powerful. And here's how we're going to close with just two aspects of this. Having appeared, they believe. Having said peace to them, they've touched him and they've handled him. He says to them, he charges them to forgive the sins of people. We remember this part. Remember, the sins that you forgive are forgiven. Any of the sins that you remit are remitted. This is extraordinary. And John Chrysostom says, well, how do we know the difference between when to remit and forgive a sin and when to hold somebody accountable? He said, well, simple. Forgive the sins that Jesus Christ forgives. So you're going to have to struggle to find the ones that we can't forgive. We are charged upon his entering that upper room, upon his resurrection, we're charged to, one, be at peace, to be people in God, and then to go out and to forgive people. One last piece. This is an evangelical call for each one of us. Because each one of us, when we come here, we have this great privilege and honor and joy of literally putting our lips on the spoon. We take the furnace of God and we consume it. We experience Him that intimately. And John commands us and reminds us that what we are meant to do is we're meant to go out of this building and we're supposed to tell other people about him, not just in speech, but in behavior. I said at the beginning of this, if you remember, last week we heard in all of those languages, all of those languages, I will not believe. But then what happens this morning during the Orthros? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Well, how do we do that? We are meant to be 
the very presence of God in people's lives. For people who may not have been in that upper room to taste and to touch and to feel Him, for people who might not be in this room to touch and to feel and to taste Him, our job is to make Christ our life, which is the very last part of this. And then us going out, people are supposed to have the opportunity to interact with God through us. He sends us out, even as He was sent by His Father. Us who having tasted and handled Him, we say every Sunday, I believe You are the Lord of me and the God of me. Pistevo. Not just I believe in a fact, but I trust in that. I'll be faithful to that. And now it's our high call of the royal priesthood, those who have been transformed and impacted by Christ, not to keep this gift secret. John Chrysostom says there's nothing colder than a Christian who does not work for the salvation of people around them. It's our great and holy call, changed by Christ, called ourselves Christians, having consumed of Christ, to go out into the world around us and to bring the experience of this upper room into every business, office, bus, car, movie theater place we go, and we do this by forgiving people around us. We do this by being holy. Holy people act different. They're pure. They think differently about people. And we do this for the salvation of the world. That the people, not just in this room, but outside of it, who might have doubts like Thomas, understandably, maybe some of us do, but they might have an interaction with the risen Lord and then calling him the God of them, and the Lord of them, they may have life in Christ too. To God be the glory. Christ is risen.